it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, four members of CUP who've come to talk to us today uh, about varying perspectives on publishing. So we have Ben Den, Director of Publishing Academic Books, uh, Helen Barton, Commissioning Editor for Linguistics Books, we have Matt Day, Head of Open Research Policy and Partnerships, and Chris Harrison at the end, Publishing Development, Di Publishing Development Director for uh, Humanities and Social Science Books. So I'll hand over to Matt for the uh, first section. Thank you, Lauren. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> and I feel a bit, a bit exposed here. So uh, if anyone's sneaking up, then give it the pantomime. <laughs> look behind you, and I should be fine. Um, thank you, Lauren, for the introduction, and, and thanks more broadly to the library for setting up this session, uh, which has been really, really interesting so far, and I hope will continue to be. Um, we at CUP thought long and hard. We have a, a, a slot now of, of around an hour and a half to talk about publishing in the sort of from policy to reality uh, um, uh, uh, mindsets and we thought very long and hard about what we could bring to the table here. Um, there's a lot of talk, indeed a lot of noise about scholarly monograph publishing, uh, the role of open access, uh, the role of publishers within the academic system currently as the very productive and inspiring talks this morning uh, I thought uh, show. Uh, within this, I think there are some really key themes to focus on. Uh, first and foremost uh, is the future of the academic monograph. Inherent to this question, what does the academic monograph play? What role does it play in the research process in 2020? Does it remain relevant? Are there other mechanisms for publishing research which are going to supersede it? Uh, some consensus on, on this question is really important if we're going to move to a world in which this research is funded through different paths and disseminated differently. I'm just going to start my stop. Sorry. 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 If we assume the monograph is going to stay relevant, then we need to get into the mechanics. Uh, this form of publishing has been squeezed over the past few decades by dwindling sales. That in turn causes publishers to increase prices, to streamline processes in an effort to maintain a sustainable publishing model. But then those lower sales, of course, mean more, more limited dissemination of that content, which in turn limits the scope and breadth of the academic debate. Open access should offer us a way to address these limitations, but we need to be realistic about the implementation. We need to balance the various requirements of good publishing, curation, preparation and positioning of content, sustainable business model, a way of keeping a diverse ecosystem in which smaller publishers can th and startups can thrive. <coughs> We need to be honest in our conversations about the challenges of OA as well as the benefits. Uh, we need to move towards greater consistency on what OA actually means in a book's context. Most importantly, we need to find practical and consistent means of making OA books a reality. And there we're talking about clearer funding paths, better information for researchers about the choices available to them, a better understanding of how OA books behave, both how they're used and how they can coexist alongside print which we know is still preferred by many readers who are looking for a, for, a, for, a, for, a, for a narrative rather than a reference. So in keeping with the policy, from policy to reality theme of today, and with these challenges in mind, we've divided our talk into four sections to try and give an honest overview of a publisher's perspective on OA in 2020, and we'll pause between the sections and we'll, we'll, we'll take questions as a group. I'm going to start off by presenting the findings of the CUP OUP 2019 monograph survey, uh, which we made public yesterday. Um, and gives a very up-to-date, uh, quantified and qualified view of the role of monographs within the academic ecosystem. Uh, my colleague Matt Day, who's um, Head of Open Research Policy and Partnerships at CUP, is going to go on to talk about definitions of open. Uh, we touched on this this morning. Um, I think that in practice the definitions are often ambiguous, they're used in different ways, they're subject to different interpretations, sometimes they're just poorly misunderstood. So I think it's, it, it's important for us to, 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 to feel as though we're talking commonly. Uh, from there, we're going to move on to the actual publishing perspective. Helen Barton, the Commissioning Editor for Linguistics Books at CUP, has been very active in putting together our current guidelines for open access. And uh, she's going to talk through the broader aspects of both the benefits and the challenges of, 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 of OA publication. And finally, Chris Harrison, uh, Publishing Development Director for HNSS Books at CUP, uh, will talk about OA in practice. Um, some of the ways in which we're experimenting with OA models at the moment and the challenges of finding sustainable models. 
Um, so, on to, on to my part of the presentation, and this is presenting our survey, uh, the role of the monograph in the research process, an overview of the CUPO UP monograph survey 2019. Um, I should note here that I'm reporting on extracts of the published report, uh, so rather than making a copy of the presentation available afterwards, I'd encourage all of you to go directly to the report, which is publicly available. I don't have a link to it on the slides, unfortunately. If you Google the CUPO UP monograph report, it comes up straight away. So the, the, the meat of my presentation is going to be going through the following things. I'm going to talk about the objectives and methodology of the report itself. I'm going to give an executive summary of the findings of the report. And then I'm going to unpack those findings in a bit more detail uh, around these four particular areas. The importance of monographs to scholarly knowledge, using and engaging with monographs, writing monographs, and the future of monographs. Now, it's really important at this point to, to, to stress that talking to a room uh, of academics, researchers, librarians, uh, publishers um, about uh, uh, the importance of the monographs to scholarly research might feel like we're in an echo chamber where we're telling ourselves what we already know. And I think I make no apology for the fact that much of the information that I put up will support positions that I think are, are held in this room already or, or reaffirm things that we already know. I think the importance of the survey is that it's very, very up to date. Uh, it's, it, it's recent. And I think that in a world where these questions are being asked, it's very important for us to know what the, to, to get a general and quantified feel of the temperature um, around this subject. So objectives and methodology of the, of the, of the survey. Um, uh, we were looking to understand the views of academic researchers, readers and authors, on what monographs mean to their work and, 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 and field. Um, we also felt that the findings could be used to inform individual contributions to current consultations, such as the UKRI's Open Access Review. Um, so we hope that, 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 that this survey will, 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 will really actively inform, inform the debate um, alongside uh, the, the, the very good work that's been, that, that's been done elsewhere to, to feed into this. Um, we received uh, 4,984 <laughs> usable anonymous responses to the survey. So it was a pretty, pretty sizable uh, response rate, indeed a fantastic response rate. Um, we had a uh, large number of free text responses within the survey, um, as well as the quantitative data, um, and that's been systematically and thematically coded to draw out various themes. It's worth pointing out now that people took a, an awful lot of time and effort with this survey, and the, I'm, I'm sure that the, the, there will be people in the room who filled it out, so thank you very much because uh, we received a huge amount of useful information, and, and, and we don't take that lightly, and I think that speaks uh, also to, the, to the, the timeliness of this topic and, and, and the passion that people feel about this topic in the current, current legal system. Um, so, uh, on to, on to the, the, the objective summary, uh, the executive summary of, 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 of what the survey showed us. Um, we were setting out to understand the value of monographs to researchers, to hear the voice of researchers on the relationship between monographs and their research activities. And as a key finding, oh, there we go. Okay. There's a roll under that. You can't escape escape right that. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Mission Impossible meets, <laughs> meets Cambridge. Um, uh, key findings of the survey um, are outlined here. Um, firstly, that monographs uh, remain a vital part of scholarly ecosystems. Uh, they're crucial to knowledge, to scholarly debate. They're crucial as a means for dissemination, access, and reference for scholars. Um, uh, they support in-depth, comprehensive analysis. Uh, they uh, help the formation of sustained arguments across a specific topic and the development of new interpretations, conclusions, and ideas. The monograph form permits researchers to build and manage a complex synthesis of multiple perspectives and nuanced argumentation, supported by detailed source analysis and contextualization. And this was a theme that came up again and again and again. And there's a lovely quote within the report itself that says, a monograph is not just a series of journal articles. You know, this is, a, this is, this is, this is, this is integral to, 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 to the process of thinking and developing uh, a line of research um, it, across, a, a, across a long form. Um, it, it, it fills a very different role. Um, 
monographs develop and enrich thinking throughout the research process. Uh, respondents reported that writing a monograph compels authors to clarify, organise and structure their thinking and to draw connections between related ideas. A large proportion of the respondents said that it was extremely or very likely that monographs in their current form will have value for their research in 10 years' time. And I think that that's really important. I think that um, a point that was made uh, uh, quite often this morning was, uh, was uh, this, 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 this question of um, uh, where, when we talk about open access and digital, we're talking about those uh, sometimes somewhat interchangeably. Um, and I think that um, uh, there's a, there's a, there's the, 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 there are questions around you know, innovation uh, within these forms of research. Um, and I think that what we've seen so far with a lot of that kind of innovation, the idea of the dynamic artifact, so on, is that, you know, we shouldn't be dismissive of that, but we're not quite there yet, that actually within this ecosystem, we're really battling between the, between the position of having something which is solid and which is there and which you can cite with having content which is, which is, which is able to be updated and changed and, 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 and more dynamic. Um, and I think that this last point really sort of um, speak, speaks to that, that um, you know, while there may be huge innovations in digital around um, relatedness and browsability and usability of monographs, the core form of that, of, of, of that research is not about to be superseded because there, there would be very real challenges to doing that and no one's really come up with a better format yet. So on to the survey findings and let's unpack a few of those statements a bit more. Um, so the first one uh, around the importance of monographs to scholarly knowledge and, 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 and what we have up here, uh, over 91% of our respondents considered monographs to be extremely or very important to the overall body of knowledge within their subject area. That compared to a figure of 94% for journal articles. Um, I, I think I, uh, th there's a lot to unpack in the survey and I didn't want to do it in, in, in uh, you know, I wanted to, to, to pick out the right things. I think. If I've not mentioned it already, uh, this was a survey out to humanities and social sciences um, uh, uh, academics. So uh, we don't have a, a STEM contingent represented in here, although of course we have the more applied end of that spectrum of, 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 of disciplines, uh, for the simple reason that you know within that field the monograph is, that does not predominate so, 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 so greatly. Respondents were asked to explain uh, uh, the reasons for their rating of monographs. Um, and I will go on to the next slide, um, uh, which gives you uh, some of the stats um, around this question. Um, the, the, the question asked here was, in your opinion, as a reader of scholarly materials, how important of each of the following types of publications the overall body of knowledge in your subject area? Um, you can see that while monographs and journals dominated the results, we solicited responses on a range of academic publishing formats. And uh, in case anyone is wondering what the end ranges were, um, I'm no statistician, so, so I asked this question myself. Um, we, we did not make uh, the answering of every single part of every question compulsory. Uh, so what the end ranges will tell you are the smallest number of respondents within that, within that group who, who answered a question compared to the, to, 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 to the ones who, um, I'm not wording that very well. You understand what I mean? The smallest number of respondents with any one of those subcategories compared to the largest. Um, so you, you, you get an idea of the size of the sample. So, uh, what, we, what, we, what we see there, as I said, is that over 90% of respondents consider monographs and journal articles to be very or extremely important in their, in their subject area. Um, and they were asked to explain their reason for the rating of monographs. Um, for those selecting extremely important, the key factors included uh, the fact that monographs provide space and scope for in-depth analysis with sustained argument on a highly specific topic, uh, that monographs are valued as an extended form, allowing scope and space for complex perspectives and arguments with detailed exposition and analysis of source material, and that as a gold standard, monographs are the main scholarly contribution in many disciplines, and they can define fields often for many years. So the longevity of this form of research after publication was, was also called out. Uh, the next uh, um, section of this I wanted to speak to uh, is around use and engagement with monographs. Um, uh, the findings we had from here are the respondents report spending a large part of their reading time with monographs, roughly equal with articles in all regions and at all career stages. Um, 
Both humanities and social science respondents spend around 80% of their reading time with monographs and journals combined, with the remainder spent with scholarly editions, textbooks and other materials. And respondents in humanities spent more of their reading time with, 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 with monographs compared to those in social sciences, so the, the, the balance was slightly different. Um, and this is that graphed up along with the, with, with the question. So the question here is, how likely is it that you would read or refer to a monograph when doing the following? Um, building a list of relevant literature in your field, synthesising and analysing literature in your field, uh, following the work of a specific author, keeping up to date on the latest thinking on a specific subject, or um, preparing for teaching. Um, and respondents across the board indicated that they're extremely or very likely to read or refer to monographs in a range of these situations. Um, uh, points that came up from this, monographs are used as reference sources, very importantly to the first point, they're used to build bibliographies, to discover relevant references. They're also important as syntheses of literature in the field, valued for their comprehensive, in-depth and definitive perspectives. Monographs are also used to keep up to date on the latest thinking and to follow the work of specific authors. Readers typically engage with monographs on a chapter level or by using references and headings as well as searching for keywords. When accessing a monograph, over 80% of respondents indicated that they were extremely or very likely to read specific chapters. Readers are less likely to read a monograph cover to cover. Early career respondents are more likely to read specific chapters, find references and search for specific keywords. Late career researchers and authors are more likely to read monographs cover to cover. So moving on to, uh, to the writing of monographs. Uh, this was a, um, a subsection, all the details are all in the report, but this was, this was a subsection of the overall, uh, the overall group because we had some, so, 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 some questions uh, around um, whether people have written a chapter or written a book that then invited um, uh, further questions. And it's important uh, to point out that the, the demographics, um, and as I say, all of this is in the main report, the, 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 the demographics, the sort of age range, were uh, pretty um, uh, equally weighted um, among the respondents for the survey. But when we got onto the questions about writing monographs, the demographics were more weighted towards um, uh, senior researchers and, 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 and people later on in their career, which is what you'd expect, but, but, but it's important to, to point that out. Um, so respondents who, uh, to the survey who'd authored uh, monographs were asked for their motivations to choose in that format. Uh, writing monographs was very or extremely important to 80% of respondents. Writing journal articles was very or extremely important to 87%. Uh, writing monographs is particularly important in the humanities and history, religion and philosophy. Uh, so in, 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 the, in, in those areas, publishing monographs is more important than publishing journal articles. Reasons given for the importance of writing monographs include scope, scale and synthesis. People saying it's what we do, so monographs being crucial to how very many fields operate, and tenure promotion and career prospects. Uh, prestige, readership and longevity, uh, books as the gold standard or coin of the realm. Um, many respondents commented on the differences between choosing to write a monograph over writing a journal article and a range of reasons were given, the key driver being the, 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 the greater scope a, a, a monograph gives. Um, so I'm sorry, I should have put this up as I read through some of those facts. I'm, I'm, I'm jumping, <laughs> jumping around. Um, but uh, as you can see from an author perspective, journal articles were considered extremely or very important to publish by 87% of respondents, followed by monographs at 80. So, this was very interesting. We, 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 we came on now to, 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 to the role and importance of, of, of publishing monographs. And the quotes in blue that you see here um, are quotes directly from the, uh, from the survey. Um, uh, so this is really you know, getting onto the qualitative element uh, um, uh, of the survey. Um, and we found that quite consistent themes emerged in the free text responses across, across questions relating to the importance of the monograph. Um, to why it was the format chosen and to its role in the research process. Um, a large number of respondents stressed the centrality of books to their field, discipline or topic of research. Uh, monographs are seen as fundamental to many disciplines and at the heart, the heart of what researchers in particular fields do. 
In addition to defining fields and areas of study, they're also the medium of scholarly communication and the expected way that significant research is disseminated and takes the field forward. So, uh, taking these four in order, uh, the monograph is an organising principle in research. Um, and this nice quote here, the book sums up the results, but the book plan also structures the work as it unfolds. Um, so that comes back to the point that I was making earlier, that lots of respondents described that how researching and writing a monograph helps them to clarify their thinking and organise their thoughts, supporting the development of ideas and arguments. In other words, the monograph is not just an output of the research process, it is integral to the process itself. Um, many made a close connection between the writing process and the researching pr research process. Constructing a monograph provided a structural or conceptual framework and drove the organisation of their work. Um, coming on to scope and scale, this is a big enough canvas for me to work on, is the quote that we chose here. Uh, many respondents expressed the importance of the monograph as providing scope to develop comprehensive, in-depth, broad and substantial work. Um, monographs enable the development of more complex arguments, providing context and generating synthesis of ideas. Uh, the third point here around impact and reception, uh, prestige and scholarly significance. Many researchers mentioned how writing a monograph establishes an academic as a scholar with the related benefits to reputation and recognition in the field. Um, a number of respondents mentioned the longevity of monographs and that they are a way to have a long-term impact in a, in, in, in a particular field of study. Um, and, uh, and, and, and finally, a career progression re reward and assessment. Uh, respondents mentioned the, those obvious facets of tenure, promotion, career prospects in connection with the questions. A relatively small number of respondents mentioned the UK ref among reasons for publishing monographs. Uh, this was a global survey. Um, so, so that 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 would likely explain some of the weighting of, of, of that point. It, 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 it did come up. Um, we asked the question: Imagine a scenario uh, where it had not been possible for you to read, you to read or publish scholarly monographs during the length of your career to date. What impact do you think this would have on your work and study? Um, and the word cloud that we've put up here um, is based on those responses. Um, I think the key point here was the language used. You know, we all work within academia in one way or another, so uh, uh, we, are, we are used to the, uh, the sort of uh, extremely erudite hyperbole uh, that we can all be, be, be prone to. It's one of the joys of being in this, in this area. Um, but the key point here was the language used. I think respondents found it difficult or even catastrophic to imagine their fields. Uh, research and careers today without uh, without monographs. So, um, unpacking that a little bit more, um, four areas: uh, research and scholarship, knowledge and understanding, career prospects, and quality of research. All of which would be impacted. On the first, on the research and scholarship, the major complaint was that the impact, the absence of the monograph, would have a negative, limiting impact on research and scholarship. It would severely hamper aspects of scholarly life. Moreover, some respondents said that their research, career or study would be impossible without the monograph. A further group of respondents said that this scenario would have had an impoverishing impact on their research, work or study, and that they would incur a negative reputational impact, such as a decreased profile uh, in, a, in a world without monographs. Uh, respondents talking about knowledge and understanding suggested that the lack of a monograph would have a major impact in, in this area or in their field. Uh, monographs are seen as important markers of many fields, uh, history stood out very notably in this area. Uh, without them, some respondents indicated that, that there would be a fragmentation of both knowledge and research, with alternate, shorter-form publication types such as journal articles having to be used as a substitute in areas where they may not be the optimum vehicle for, for, for dissemination of this kind of, of information or development of these kind of, 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 of thoughts. Um, career prospects, I've mentioned already, it remains the dominant means of career enhancement within many fields. And the quality of research, um, the negative impact on the quality of work or research was another significant concern among respondents. Uh, some respondents also commented about the demotivating impact this scenario would have, uh, with their research or work being less interesting without the monograph. Other respondents commented that they would focus more on short-term specific projects rather than longer, large-scale, in-depth projects. So, so, would you say that, so the nature of research would be impacted. <coughs> 
I mentioned before the question about whether the, the monograph would continue to have uh, value for researchers in, in, in 10 years' time, and this graph shows you the, 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 the results of that. So a total of 83% of respondents thought that uh, it was extremely or very likely um, that the monograph would have value uh, in 10 years' time. Uh, if you add the moderately likely, that goes up to 94% of, of, of respondents. Echoing comments across the survey, respondents described how monographs offer sustained engagement with complex topics, play a valuable role not met by other formats, and the longevity thing came up again that they use and remain relevant for many years. Um, we asked questions about the future of the monograph. Um, we asked respondents to think broadly about reading, writing, and publishing monographs and what they might change. Um, and I'm going to talk about these three different areas separately. Um, uh, generally, some consider that there were too many monographs being published now, uh, and of these, there were, there were, there were um, some quality issues within the monographs being published. Uh, lots of people said that there was a lot of pressure on young academics to publish quickly to get tenure, uh, for example, you know, or, or for example, for, for, for the REF. Um, on the three different areas, on publishing monographs, some commented on the editorial review processes, uh, time between manuscript to submission and publication often being too long. So there were calls to try and, 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 and bring that time down. Some made suggestions around improving publishing processes. Uh, we had comments about the double-blind peer review system. Some were critical about this. They said they felt limited by not being able to react directly to reviewers' comments. Um, some respondents talked about adding more supplementary material to, 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 to books online. Um, under the broad theme of reading monographs, the most dominant response related to access with lots of comments on the price of the monograph, uh, often considered to be too expensive for the individual buyer and also not affordable for libraries. And I think that comes back to why this is so relevant to the conversation that we're having today um, about, about means of broader dissemination of, of, of this kind of content. Um, under the broad theme of writing monographs, the most common response related to time. So lots of people commented on the lack of time to write and read monographs, you know, given a, 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 a teaching load and other responsibilities. Um, uh, you know, commented that they did not have sufficient time to devote to their research. Um, and related to this, we had lots of comments on desire for shorter content and the need for a mid-length category so the 30 to 60,000 words in publishing, and it's interesting that, 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 that many publishers are, are creating their own responses to that demand now. Um, and I think it will be very interesting to see in the next few years how that kind of medium format, uh, somewhere between a journal article and a book uh, level of research, uh, finds its way into a more formal position within the, within, the, within the academic ecosystem. We touched on it this morning, the, 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 the increasingly blurred lines between these and the difference between a you know, 100,000 word book and, a, and an article of a couple of thousand words. Um, key themes and comments by those who indicated that the monograph was extremely likely to have value for their research in 10 years time were similar to the themes outlined in the earlier responses, that it's the only format that allows an, in, a sufficient space for in-depth engagement with complex topics. Um, a very small minority of participants thought that the monograph was unlikely to retain its value for, for work or research. Um, people talked about the, uh, this being the perfect format and the gold standard in the academic field. Historians in particular stressed the incredible importance of the monograph within their field. Uh, the inherent value of monographs was stressed as, as being the place where quality research was most likely to be published within these fields. So, that's, yeah, so in, in summary, um, uh, crucial role of the monograph in research and scholarly communication is set to endure. I think I'll go back to the point I made originally. Why am I telling all of you this? You, you know, I think many of you feel this already. Well, you know, this was a, 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 a very broad survey and a global survey, and I think it supports the position that in whatever way we work together to enable this means of disseminate, dissemination to, to, to endure and indeed thrive in the next few years, um, it's clear that, 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 that the mandate is there. Um, and the uh, final point, I think, on this is that you know, we need to be thinking about how this evolves in an increasingly open and digital world so that we can continue to meet the needs of researchers and, and authors in the future. So that is 
it from me. Um, I said I'd do 30 minutes, I came in at 27 and a half, so uh, I'm quite pleased with that. Um, <laughs> does anybody have any questions? Uh, we've been talking a lot about digital uh, versus open access and all that this morning. I was just wondering, could you delve into the kind of digital aspect of one uh, I mean, it was touched on, uh, certainly. You know, I mean, I think I think one of the things that was quite interesting, a point that I made earlier, was the was, was the point about the uh, respondents who um, were uh, interested in reading chapters and smaller smaller se sub segments of of of, of, um, of books as opposed to uh, reading the books cover to cover. And there indeed was a bit of a disparity between more of the early career researchers talking about dipping in and out, which I think indicates that they were using digital. I mean, I think it's important to stress that um, what we what we were really setting out to do here, you know, there are, there are, there are um, lots of surveys and lots of great work going on at the moment about open access directly within this field um, and also about the kind of digital versus um, print question. And I think it's important to point out that, that the, 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 the aims of this survey were not that. They were really to sort of catch the monograph within the research process in whatever form it may take. But I think that some of those answers about you know, narrative reading versus reference kind of spoke to that. And I think those also really um, uh, illustrate uh, the importance of these two formats coexisting. I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of non-binary thinking. And I think that this debate has been, um, uh, has been not helped by um, uh, the kind of binary thinking on one side or the other. You know, which, 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 which the human brain is sort of predisposed to, 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 to head towards. Um, so I think that that, that kind of, that, that idea of these two formats coexisting and serving very, very different functions um, is, is borne out and I think is, is, is appealing and important. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have questions? Yeah, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on the discussion about I should also note that uh, all of our CP speakers will remain at the front, so if you do have questions that relate to the different talks, you can yeah. ask them I'll, I'll anytime. I'll just take this off before I say something I regret on my <laughs> <laughs> Great. So up next we have Matt Day talking about the definitions of open. Hi, thank you. <clears throat> so this question, I think, has been debated for about 20 years, but I'm going to do a very light touch on it. I'm actually going to be very quite quick. I, I, I think I can beat your 27 minutes today, actually, then. Um, CUP is undergoing a major programme to get all of our journals open access and we would do it tomorrow in entirety if we could um, but it's going to be a very long project with books I think, I think we're, we're, we're very much thinking what can we do you know, in the near future to make more of our books more open and it does raise the question a little bit of, well, what do we mean by open? You know, if, if we compromise on how open, does that allow us to do it, you know, apply it more broadly, for example? So I just want to talk very quickly about how I'm viewing it, or how we're viewing it, um, and um, what this might mean for monographs in the future. So I'm, I'm imagining that Helen, she's still here? Uh, yes, Helen Snaith, who has got, I think, probably one of the hardest jobs in, in policy at the moment, she may be smiling inwardly or outwardly on this because <laughs> you've got to come up with an answer on this seriously. But I, I have the, the, the opportunity that, that we can think it even more broadly. So, so we're not necessarily going to be constrained. We need to meet the minimum requirements that the funders are going to um, uh, require of us. But we, are, we do have other options. If there are other things we think we can do, obviously we're still going to be free to do that. So I just wanted to start by saying that even though open access, you can boil it down into a very simple statement um, in practice. And, and nobody, I think, has actually boiled it down into a simpler statement than Plan S, which is everything has to be free for reuse in any way by anyone on publication. That's a pretty simple definition. But in reality, the, the guidelines and, re and technical implementation of that can be quite long and if, if you want to say that your research is plan s compliant it has to fulfill those criteria so that does define what they mean by it um, I, in, in fairness some of those are recommendations and they're not all on publishers there's on re repositories but it's still a big long list of requirements right 
But just for today, I want to break it down into the three most common things, which is you can freely access it without any barrier. You can redistribute it. So those, two, those first two things are really about, you know, maximizing awareness and uh, dissemination. And then the third thing is can be adapted and reused um, in different ways. They're the, they're the three things. And anything, if you call something open, I think you have to be dealing with those, at least one or two, or ideally all three of those three things. So um, I just want to make a point. I don't want to labor this too much, but whatever we do, however we publish work in an open way, it has to be supported through, an, through some kind of a legal framework. Even if no one understands or cares about the legal underpinnings, it does need a legal un underpinning. And everything that we do, we have to make sure, we, everything we do as a publisher, we have to make sure that, that you know, the rights are in place. And, and I also just want to make the point, because I, I get, I guess, a lot of uh, kind of external in inquiries and questions. And a very common one is really about licensing issues. So I just wanted to make the point in case there are prospective authors or authors in the audience who are a little bit confused. Open access is really about the license that you give the end user to do stuff. It's really nothing at all about the, the, the agreement between the publisher and the author. That, that's a whole separate thing, but that agreement has to inlay and that allow the end user to be given the rights they need. Um, so I think we have a very, very powerful framework. It has its critics, but I, I think that the, the legal framework we have at the moment, which is essentially Creative Commons licenses, is, has been really powerful, very flexible, and I think is, is as far as I can see at least, is going to give us all the things we need to do in the future. Because it gives a very clear way for you to give end users uh, the right to do anything at all, so that would be CC0, the right to just do whatever they want as long as they attribute the, the you know, cite the original um, source, which is just good academic practice. Uh, the limit, uh, to, and then to apply selectively limits to whether commercial use can be made or um, whether people can create derivatives. And the, the, the other thing I want to, the other, the other point I want to make here, again, because I get questions, and I think it's really, it's just a fundamentally murky subject, is what do we mean by commercial versus non-commercial, uh, commercial and non-commercial? So I, I think there's a strong ethos that publicly funded research should be used for the good of all society, including, you know, new products and services, commercial development, um, so there should be publicly funded research should not be published in a way that limits the new knowledge, the new findings, the new ideas to be used commercially. But that's very different to the thing that's published, the book or the journal article, being you know printed and sold you know to compete with the publisher, what the publisher is doing, undermining the publisher, doing it more cheaply because they haven't had to do all the other work the publisher's done. Um, so I, I, I think that there's quite a bit of confusion about what this means, but I would say I would I would say straight, state quite strongly that it's it, that publicly funded research should be used for commercial purposes, but not to undermine the viability of the thing that's being published itself. Um, so I won't I don't want to go into that too much more, but to me that that just feels like something where there's we have arguments discussions that, that aren't fully kind of meshed. Where the, where the protagonists aren't really quite using the words in the same way. So I, th I think in practice, um, what's been going on with open, this, this is kind of like what's been going on with open in journals, but that does translate into books to some extent, um, and essentially kind of lays out the landscape where we as a publisher can start to think about doing more or less of these types of things. Um, but the first thing is, is piracy, just straightforward piracy. That, that's been a massive part of, of open, uh, open content over the last few years. And it's, it's, it's highly coordinated, it's, it's highly illegal, um, but it hasn't destroyed the, the publishing industry yet. But it's not, it's, the publishing industry is not quite the same as the music industry where piracy was very damaging because libraries, the people who are buying the content or paying for the stuff to be published, aren't advocating 
or really, to any great extent, kind of enabling um, piracy to undermine the system. But piracy is definitely there, and it's been very big, and it's, it's, um, it has an effect. If, if we use, lose usage of content because people are finding it easier to go to piracy sites, we can't then go to our subscribers. Uh, I know we don't, we probably want to move away from subscriptions, but we can't go to our subscribers or anyone else who's paying for content and saying it's being used this much. This is the value, this is the impact that that work has had. Or going to the authors and saying that, that, that this has been the, the impact of the work because it's all happening invisibly. Um, but a step down from, from piracy is social sharing, which, which has been viewed by some publishers in some situations as being essentially not far off piracy. But it's been, you know, it's again, it's been going on for years. People send PDFs to their friends. You know, they, they may stick stuff on the internet in social sharing sites outside the publisher's policies. Um, but this kind of sharing is just a natural part of research. It's a natural part of how people want to spread the word about what they've done and also learn about what other people have done. So that, ha that social sharing has been a big part of making research outputs more open. But, it, but there's nothing about social sharing that goes anywhere near funder compliance. So when funders require open, it doesn't, it's never complied. It, social sharing is never really a way to, to meet those requirements. Um, and then we've kind of got two, two areas, green and gold. So I know people in, who are thinking about this in books want to get away, well, Plan S wants to get away from the green and gold terminology for journals, and we're increasingly wanting to get away from it for books as well, I think, which I think is great. But the essential concept is it's really, you know, what's being made public and when, and what rights do end users have. Um, so, you know, a full Creative Commons license available to end users so that they can reuse content in any way, including you know, creating a derivative work which they then sell because they've done something very interesting and, and added value to it. And they can do all of that on publication. That, that's the most extreme kind of gold end. And then there's, there's you know, pre-final, under, um, under embargo, maybe more restrictive licenses. That kind of gets you into the more green um, end of things. But that, that basic menu is, I think, pretty much what we've got to work with. Um, and I've, want, I've kind of wanted, because of some of the stuff that we've heard so clearly today from Martin and others, the essential problem that the, the, the whole way the books business works, um, it would be way too expensive and impossible to make every book properly gold open access under an APC based framework. It's neither desirable nor possible. Um, if we're trying to come up with ways to make stuff more open, but using the traditional business model of selling print copies, the more we make it complete open access, you know, the more gold it becomes, the more we start to undermine the traditional model, the more, the, the, the greater the risk that the whole thing won't work in t over a reasonable time period, a few years. That gets us back into, well, what can we dilute it a bit? Can we do things that are useful, not completely gold, you know, immediately on publication that does tend to support the business model while we're exploring new business models? So I think we as a publisher are thinking about how can we increase making, th make things more open um, and then eventually you know hopefully I, per, speaking personally and I think probably for many of our colleagues I would imagine why, why wouldn't we make everything completely open on publication if we possibly could um, uh, that's easier to imagine it's hard to imagine for journals but it's really hard to imagine for books at the moment um, so I, th I think we, we are struggling with these basic things. I mean, we, could we make something free to read but you can't print and download it? I think I'm really interested in that. We have social sharing services, core share we call it. Other publishers have other things. There are researchgate and academia.edu websites where people put things. Um, or that generally they allow downloading. But there are lots of ways where we might just increase accessibility and visibility through free to read. It's more marketing than open access, but it's a, you know, it's a step to, up, it's a step to, to more open. Um, and then I think we're just into discussions about, well, if that's not enough, 
you know, how, how can we stepwise make things more open while not undermining the, the, the sustainability of the underlying um, publishing business. Um, so, so this is just to reframe it, really. I mean, how can we, how can we, make, how can we stepwise or, or make big jumps towards making monographs more open and who's paying for it? And uh, a lot of what we're doing in the short term is, well, people that buy print copies are paying for it. But I think that, that that second part is also going to evolve over time as well. Thank you. Nobody's yeah. dropped it yet. No, I know. So, um, um, dropping. Quite a few times today we've heard uh, quite negative sentiments about green open access. And coming from a library perspective, I find that quite, it, it's quite hard to understand where, that, uh, where that's coming from. Because as far as I can see, there is no money for gold open access for books. It's just that we, we've seen the figures, we've seen that there's the, the extreme rate is counting. And I read an article, I can't remember, I can't remember what it was, but it was um, it said that even though the, the book processing charges may be about 15,000 or, or thereabouts, that doesn't even cover the full cost of producing an open access book. So book processing, book processing charges don't seem to work. So in my mind, green open access seems like the only viable option. And what, sh what we should be doing is trying to refocus resources into improving repository infrastructure, which is already fantastic. It's, all, it, it, it's amazing that all these institutions have these incredible interconnected repositories, and they're all feeding information into external databases and then pulling it all back in. It's all, it's all very technologically advanced, but it could be improved if there was more funding put into it. So one thing I'd like to see is UKRI putting money into, earmarking money into repository development. So really, I, I just think there should be more discussion around green open access and uh, it shouldn't be fobbed off as somehow inferior when in fact it would actually serve all of the purposes we're talking about. Free access, uh, freely available, if we have reuse licenses. I mean, so I, I can, I, I uh, I'm, I'm going to give you some very clear and strong answers to that, but I'm, because of that, I'm going to preface it by saying we, we do support green. We have green policies. Absolutely. We are going to be, I, I, we are almost certainly going to be, you know, significantly increasing our support for green in terms of facilitating green archiving. We, as a press, see that green is, is part of the transition, right? So, uh, there are several, I, I, I personally think that green is, 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 the more you get into green, the more you're entrenching problems. Green only exists because the traditional business models continue to exist, okay? So whether that's subscri subscribing to journals, which people hate and we're trying to get away from, or whether it's buying print copies, which may, you know, shift a bit in the future. It, it absolutely depends on the green, on, on the traditional business model, and that's, that's not compatible with a new proper, born away, you know, everything geared towards our way world. So it, it, it's, it's just incompatible with the way we want the future to be. Um, it I mean, massive parallel infrastructure. Uh, I mean, I've, I'm prepared to bet, I'm sticking my neck out, that there are more people at academic institutions archiving green content than there are people in publishing companies publishing it. It's massively expensive. It's still increasing. If books go that way too, which I think I'm imagining, they, I think I, I would guess they will, that's going to be even more work. It's, it's utterly, utterly inefficient. And fundamentally, if the green version is good enough and does what people need, you don't need the final version. But a lot of work's gone into the green, the, the green version, but no one's paying for it, and no one will pay for it because they, they don't want the final version. So it's, it's, not, it's not a vision for the future. But I totally understand that an institute or a community that wants everything to be open access and can't afford the current gold models that publishers like us are offering, 
I totally understand why you want it because it's the only way you can see to get it at the moment. But it's not going to work for the future. I suppose the same uh, argument could be, could be flipped and you can see that Sorry. green open access is actually, as it stands, okay. will actually bring about a change in business models for the traditional. Uh, although it's, it could be described as somehow symbiotic or even parasitic on the traditional publishing infrastructure, it could be seen as oppositely, you could say that actually it could bring about a change in those traditional publishers. So I, th I think I should hand to my colleagues who are probably going to pick up some of these points as they yes. talk about some of the other, some of the other approaches. Yeah, thanks. Well, I'm a US academic, um, and so I'm hearing a lot of dancing around of international concerns. This is not on the radar of the US at all that, I'm, that I've heard. Um, and so it's raising a lot of interesting opportunities in my mind, but a lot of um, questions, and um, a lot of those questions have to do with whether we're talking about two different streams of publishing, since we're not being required to do open access. I am also a CUP author, by the way, so this is kind of near and dear to my heart um, from everything you're saying. Um, but it's going to affect the publishing world. So in my mind, royalties are coming up, for instance, um, as an issue, which we haven't really talked about. Um, citation norms um, and what's expected. I could see advantages to open access publishing, but who pays? Especially if my research is funded by the NEH, which to my knowledge is not making this um, possible in their grant giving. Nothing's changing in our grant scheme. Our institutions would not pay for it. So um, I think these are real concerns when you think about non-European and non-UK um, scholars, um, and also in terms of our, our career trajectories. What happens if one of us decides to come to the EU or the UK, or vice versa, um, going the other way? What happens when we collaborate with British academics? Um, how does that work? So, so I'm interested in the US case. Um, can I just take your name? Maybe we can talk later. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, I've been at CUP for 20 years now, um, and I've commissioned in a range of subject areas, history, archaeology and anthropology, and for the last 17 years, uh, language and linguistics. So I've seen sort of quite a lot of changes over, over the last uh, couple of decades in how we publish monographs. Digital publishing has sort of changed the landscape, and then, of course, open access even, even more so. Um, so for the kind of the past year, I've been working with some colleagues to kind of bring together all we know so far about open access and to develop a kind of manual for uh, my colleagues within the press as a sort of go-to. Um, oh, oh, I've still not got this. Oh, you still have it. Um, yeah, just in case anyone can't hear me. <laughs> so yeah, we've been developing this this manual as a kind of go-to place for everyone that works at the press, um, so that we're all kind of on the same page about open access what we need to do and some of the benefits and challenges um, that we face so that when um, we're editors are having conversations with potential authors, um, we, we have um, some idea of, um, of, of a plan of what we, we might be thinking about. Um, so first of all, in terms of the benefits, okay, oh, good. Um, it's, um, there are a lot of benefits of open access publishing, and the way we see it at CUP is it's got to be a mutually beneficial venture um, for all the stakeholders involved. So for the publisher, the institution, the author, the funding body. Um, so in terms of benefits for the author, we want to make sure that um, your book is published in accordance with the uh, open access requirements um, of your, your institution, your funding body, um, or maybe just your own wish to make your work freely available. Um, and a benefit of publishing open access with CUP as an author is that you will get the same high quality service, so that's in terms of editorial, production, marketing, as you would for a traditional non-OA monograph. Um, and also your book would carry the exact same level of high quality and prestige as a, as a traditional monograph as well, so would undergo the same rigorous peer review process. Um, and 
Though, and the additional benefits for the author and for the publisher as well is, of course, the book is freely available. It can be shared widely. We hope it will um, reach a broader audience. So that includes uh, students, scholars in developing countries, of course, subject to uh, digital access, which has been touched on this morning. Um, we hope it will end up with a much increased use in research. And, uh, and for the publisher as well, it means that our content being more freely available makes us more visible as a publisher as well. Um, there are also benefits for the funders. Um, for example, um, we, um, it means that the findings of their funded research are more widely available. Um, and for that reason, I think some funders will be having a, mon a mandate on gold open access publishing as well. Um, and also, it raises the profile of the funder as well. Um, in, in, in your brand name, institution, your philosophy. So there are sort of prestige and reputational benefits for the funder as well. So those are what we see as the, as the benefits for everybody of open access publishing, which everyone's probably agreed on. But as a publisher, of course, we face a lot of challenges as well. Um, so now I'm going to sort of talk through some of, some of these challenges. Um, we don't have all the solutions yet. We are still, you know, this is all still subject to discussion. Um, but one of the, the, the biggest challenges is sort of developing sustainable business models for publishing open access monographs. Um, we have to um, make it a sustainable business model while at the same time making sure that we maintain the high quality and academic rigour that Cambridge's publishing programme is known for. Um, so, and quality control is a big part of that. Um, we want to make sure that our monographs and our authors, when they are published on an open access basis, are given exactly the same attention and care as for a non-open access monograph. Um, and the selection process is exactly the same as well. I think, you know, um, it's sort of a common myth that um, the um, open access monographs are maybe less of a high quality. Um, that's, that's not true at CUP at least. Um, we, we still are very, very selective about what we publish. We're committed to only publishing the very, very best research. And just because we're collecting a, a processing fee up front doesn't mean that we would publish something we would not otherwise publish. Um, it's it's uh, subject to exactly the same rigorous peer review process that, and, and our peer re review process at CUP is widely recognised as one of the best and most rigorous in the world, and we're absolutely committed to uh, sticking to that. Um, so just to um, say a bit more about our standard BPC model. Chris, who's coming up next, will talk to you about some alternative business models that we've been looking at for open access. But our standard gold BPC model is that we are currently charging £9,500 um, for um, the first 120,000 words. Um, for uh, subjects um, in the science, technology and medicine which have um, uh, lots of figures, we will include 85 figures in that. It's then £16 for each additional figure, £55 for each, for each extra 1,000 words on top of the 120,000. Um, we publish a print version of the monograph at the same time, which is published and sold at the same price as it would be if it was a non-OA monograph, and we do pay out royalties on the, the print version as well. Um, we publish them under Creative Commons licenses. Um, as Matt has mentioned, I think the default for a monograph is CC by NC, so it can be shared and adapted as long as the author is credited, but for non-commercial use, we can also offer the ND license as well, so that um, authors are protected from unauthorised adaptations being created or shared. Um, and the, the processing fee, it may sound a lot, but it does cover the cost of delivering the same high quality product as a non-OA monograph. That includes upfront costs which were previously covered by the print component. We do expect the, the, the print sales of, a, of an OA monograph to decline over time. Um, it's competitive with what other publishers are charging. And we do think it's a fair price in terms of the service we offer, in terms of the quality of the product and the distribution. And also at the press, we are a non-profit organisation as well, so any money we do make is, is reinvested back into the business. Um, so another challenge that we face is that of discoverability. We want to ensure that our monographs are fully discoverable um, so that everybody can, can find them, everybody knows they're open access, we're not hiding it at all. Um, and we also want to be able to obtain reliable use of statistics for them. So that's really important in gathering evidence of the benefits of open access publishing, how widely used our open access monographs are. Um, so we clearly flag on our own site, Cambridge Core, which is the site where we host all of our digital products, we clearly flag that they are gold open access. 
um, and we have a dedicated open access page on our online platform where you can see all of our open access monographs. Um, another sort of myth is that publishers don't kind of make it public when their um, publications are open access. We do. We make sure it's clearly stated in every blurb, um, all the metadata that goes out, out to the public, including on Amazon, that it is available gold open access. So our readers do have the choice to access it for free online if they want to. Um, we also monitor the usage as well on our, our core site. Um, so you can see from the graph that, um, at least on an individual chapter basis, um, open access chapters are downloaded a lot, lot more than, than, than those of non-open access monographs. Um, we also have partnerships with some third parties, so open, ac ac open access publishing and European networks and their related um, site, the directory of open access books. Um, they host our books on their plat our open access monographs on their platform as well. Um, and they do provide some user statistics as well, so we can see how, um, how, how far and how widely our books are being used. Um, we do still need to do some research to find out the exact results and how widespread that is. Um, and then one of the main challenges is around sales. Um, so the challenge from a sales point of view is to, is to sustain su the successful open access business model through a combination of print sales and the book processing charge. Um, and it's very difficult at the moment to tell how that's going to pan out in the longer term because up to January 2020, we will only have published 56 um, open access monographs. So it's a small number to, to see how, to, 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 for us to be able to forecast the bigger picture. Um, at the moment, when a, when a monograph is published gold open access, the print uh, copies actually are selling pretty much the same as they would for, uh, for a non-open access monograph. Um, slightly lower, but comparable. But we expect that over time, the print sales will decline because um, library buying habits are going to change as open access becomes more and more um, prevalent, mandatory in some cases, um, and, the, and the longer term picture changes, print sales probably will drop. So our BPC will probably end up having to account for the loss of print sales. Um, and another loss we make on gold open access is that we completely lose the digital sale. And um, for Monograph, digital sales are a really increasingly important proportion of our sales. In fact, no other type of book publishing is as dependent on that, that as, as monographs. Monographs are similar to journals in that way. Um, so, and we already offer our uh, customers good value for money with our paid for digital versions because there's not too much digital rights management. We're quite flexible in the sharing that we can, that we can allow. So, um, so we will completely lose digital sales if it's freely available online. Um, and then we also have to take into account our overheads um, editorial expenses, the creation process, um, everything that goes into creating a high quality product is all accounted for in, in, our, in our BPC and then we have to sort of add sales onto that and kind of get a bigger financial uh, picture in the end um, but when we start to publish more open access monographs we will know more about how, um, how well they're going to do for us financially in the longer term um, and then finally just some of the other challenges that we're, we are facing um, for example, in making open access publishing equally accessible to everyone across the scholarly community. And um, these are some issues that have already been touched on this morning. Um, for example, at the moment, our, our BPC is, is currently the same across all subject areas, but we do sort of appreciate that the cost of publishing might be different or greater for some subject areas than others. For example, we've, we spoke this morning about um, uh, books that have, are contain, contain a high amount of illustrations and third party materials. Um, it, that means that art subjects, art history for example, music, um, geography with lots of maps, those kinds of subject areas are going to be possibly more expensive um, to, to produce um, and to publish on an open access basis because of all the third party materials in there. Um, so um, you know, that's something we have to consider and find ways to support. Some subject areas, um, for example the humanities versus the hard sciences, might have more or less access to funding for open access than others. Again, something that you know we have to factor into our considerations in the future. Um, and then um, copyright has been touched on a lot. This is something that affects digital publishing in general, um, but it could be prohibitive in some areas that are illustration heavy. Um, so we have we, we have to sort of look at what our licenses cover, what kind of sources our authors can go to for third party materials. The other thing we've been looking into is chapter level open access. Um, this particularly concerns edited volumes, for example. Um, if, 
an individual chapter, just like a journal article, counts as an individual research paper, an ind uh, individual piece of research. So the author might have a funding or institutional requirement to publish it on a gold OA basis. Um, but then we've got um, an issue whereby if we've got a book that's hybrid and some chapters are open access and some aren't, what do we then do about the issue of double dipping in the sense that we've already taken a subscription for some of those books that will have to kind of reduce the price accordingly to account for the fact that some of those chapters are open access. Um, and for that reason, at the moment, edited volumes um, that we publish gold are just published like a single unit. It's, it's one fee. Um, but whether we can break open access down into individual chapters is something that we have to consider for the future as well. Um, so that's just some of the, the kind of issues that we still need to find solutions to and that are still subject to further discussion. So yeah, that's pretty much all I've got to tell you. So any questions? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, um, you might not have the data for that, so potentially maybe a, a prediction of um, impact on print sales for open access books, and if you see a difference between library and individual purchases, or a difference between different list prices of books? Um, when it comes to library purchase, it's similar. The, the, the print has dropped slightly if the book is available open access. When it comes to individual, mainly our open access books are on our institutional site Cambridge Core so they're only sort of access through libraries mm -hmm. the individual sale doesn't sort of come in until a couple of years later when the book comes out in paperback and then it's going to be on, on Amazon for Kindle and all those kinds of third party so we d so again it's, it's going to be the longer term picture to know how that's going to go um, but yeah I mean if it's if it's been available open access will will it still be purchased for Kindle later on we don't know so Hi, can I just um, go back on a couple of bullet points? So yeah. you're charging the same for a paper copy of the traditionally published book as you are for a, an open access published yes. book. So the same price point, yes, say yeah. 50 pounds, for example. Yep. And you're seeing nearly the same sales from a traditional book as an open access book. At the moment, And yet are. the open access book, you're charging nearly 10,000 pounds to publish and the traditional one, nothing to publish. That seems quite interesting. <laughs> well, it's 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 the longer term picture that we're that we have to consider because um, at the moment, yes, libraries do still seem to be buying print copies, but as digital becomes more prevalent, as open access becomes more prevalent, possibly mandatory in some cases. You know, there there is talk, for example, in the future of um, of um, the ref, for example, everything being submitted for the ref has to be open access. As more and more, as open access becomes more and more prevalent, we we will see a drop in print sales. So it's it's kind of in anticipation of that as well. Um, and also, the digital sales um, take such a hit. Digital sales are such an important part of monograph publishing. And um, we, with when a book is open access, we completely lose the digital sales. So the BPC will also <coughs> cover what we lose there. Um, as, as well as the, you know, we have to, we're paying out exactly the same expenses in curating and commissioning and marketing the book as we are for a traditional monograph as well. So it, it, it will balance out, but we will have a bigger picture. What, we've only published 56 monographs at the moment, open access. When we publish more and we've got more data, we can adjust our, our finances accordingly if we, if we have to. Yeah. yeah, I mean, my suggestion is maybe that I understand you've set the BPC on your estimated revenue return is that maybe at some point you might reduce your BPC um, if, if, if that is just simply being estimated too high. Clearly other publishers are offering a lower BPC point for the same quality. Yeah, I mean, we, we definitely would review it um, in, the, in the future. That we, but um, as well, um, CUP are a non-profit organisation, so any, anything that we do make extra from the BPC is going to be reinvested straight back into our publishing and making a, a, a better uh, quality service for our authors as well. So. Um, so there's that to factor in. But yeah, I mean, once we know more and we've published more open access books and we've got the bigger picture, then we would certainly review our whole finances around it. I think in the interest of the time, we're going to move on to the questions. Uh, but any questions you have, please feel free to ask at the end of the time. But we'll do the panel questions. I think we might have a discussion about the, the traditional publishers versus the, um, the newer publishers. So good afternoon. Um, so I'm just going to conclude by talking about some of the, um, the experiments that we're doing around open access. 
but within the wider context of the, um, the humanities and social sciences book list. And I call the, the talk, this, this session, Sharing Knowledge is Cool, because I think we all kind of agree that we, we want to do all we can to make um, knowledge, to share it as widely as possible, as accessible as possible. A number of um, early speakers this morning were talking about the pleasure they saw when they saw you know, the, the great download um, figures they, they got, and maybe download figures in parts of the world which um, um, weren't usually associated with book buying and so forth. Well, just to say that we also get a kick out of that. We kind of, it's increasingly kind of the, um, the metrics for, for usage, um, are ones which we look at as much as, you know, as, um, as sales. It's, it's important for us. It's a real kind of validation exercise for us of, of, of our worth as, as publishers. Um, so just to talk a, bit, a little bit about the kind of the wider context of the, of the CUP list. Um, very pleased that a number of authors and, and series editors here. And um, each year, um, within the offices in Cambridge and New York, um, in Delhi, um, Singapore and Beijing, we publish roughly 800, you know, what you loosely call monographs every, every year. Um, we do that year in, year out. For each one of those monographs has been through a really kind of thorough review process. Those that have benefited, um, come through the series, have benefited from the advice of um, people such as Margot, um, other series editors who kind of, um, we're really grateful for, for all the work they do. Um, but we, as Helen has said, every single project we do goes through a pretty rigorous peer review process. We have a minimum of two reviews. Frequently it's five or, or six. If it's anything interdisciplinary, it'll be a lot more. And we have a very high percentage of um, sort of revise and resubmits. I mean, I'd guess that probably um, getting on to 50% of the, the monographs that eventually get published by us uh, go through a revise and resubmit process. So it's a long-term kind of uh, relationship and process that we have. I don't think we can ever get quite as close to the amazing advice I think um, the Royal Historical Society are putting in that mentoring for, for early career scholars. But we do our best to really kind of to support authors um, uh, to, you know, to help them um, shape and craft their, their work as best they poss possibly can. So um, I don't think she's a plant in the audience, but I mean, the, one of the questions earlier highlighted this other bullet point. We have a very international mix of authors from, you know, from all over the world, from uh, places where, for some places, um, you know, open access is, is really important. In other cases, other places, people never talk about it, don't care about it. Um, so, and looking at the overall press list, I put less than 25%. I think that's a bit unfair. I'd say roughly about a third of our author base is probably, um, is probably kind of UK. Equally, we kind of um, are dependent on um, sales around the world. North America, surprise, surprise, is, is the biggest market, but it, it varies by, by subject and discipline. So um, those are some sort of, some sort of minimum, maximum type of, of ranges there that I've put there for, for regional sales. And as Helen was saying, kind of digital is really, really important for, for, for monographs um, um, and accounts for 30 to 40 percent of the revenue for each list. And to you know the question earlier about sort of um, you know kind of print sales holding up and, and so forth, we what we have seen over the years um, is obviously kind of a steady decline in print sales. Um, and the all the kind of the feedback we're getting from, from libraries around the world is very much a move towards kind of digital uh, digital preferred acquisition. Um, and as Helen was saying, it's quite a good deal that um, the digital acquisition has in terms of no, um, no restriction on the numbers of users in the library network. The, the content is owned in perpetuity. It's not an annual subscription. So all in all, and um, obviously kind of recognizing that there's always room for improvement and we're kind of we're learning um, as we go and we kind of screw up every now and again and things. We know all that, but on the whole, we think we've done a pretty good job over the years in meeting the needs of um, the scholarly community broadly defined with you know, kind of what we think is a thoughtful and sustainable but also evolving mix of services, uh, not just for authors, not just for researchers, but for librarians as well. So we're looking at that whole, whole mix. Um, and that's really important for us. To, um, you know, we're very proud of that service. We're talking a little bit about early career um, authors. Um, we do a lot of workshops going out to universities, not just in the UK and Europe, but um, in, in Asia, in Africa as well, talking to, um, to, to scholars to try and demystify the publishing process, the scholarly environment, to, to encourage them to, to see themselves as, as potential Cambridge authors. So that's um, the kind of the, the context. And I think the question, obviously, for, for this um, 
uh, this day today is how can we integrate sort of more kind of open access models more, more effectively into this mix. So our OA experience to date has been limited. So it's a relatively kind of small number of, um, of, of books that, that have gone through kind of the gold OA route. And I'm not going to talk any more about gold OA because I, mean, I think one thing, one kind of theme um, that's been sort of consistent across all the talks today, I think, is that you know that the the HMS S world is kind of strapped for cash. There's not loads and loads of money out there to pay, um, you know, for every single monograph that's published um, as a gold um, gold BPC. So we kind of we, we are going down that route um, where and when we can, and we're kind of we're learning about how <coughs> behaviours uh, and so forth are changing. But um, we thought if we were just to depend on that, then we wouldn't actually be learning very much. But we do actually have to be more proactive ourselves and to set up some experiments and to participate in experiments that other people have set up to try and understand more kind of all this kind of complex you know, kind of network of, um, of, uh, of, of relationships and um, things which happen if, if we try and move towards a more kind of uh, consistent open world. And I've said there kind of uh, necessity being mother of invention, we're seeing some interesting experiments. And I think within this room, um, some of the you know the players, large and small, are doing some really interesting, creative things. And in our own way, we, we've tried also um, you know, as a traditional publisher to to um, you know, to, to to be on the front foot and, and to experiment. So I'm going to just run through kind of four basic types of experiments that we've been involved in. One is very well known, I think, Knowledge Unlatched. Martin was talking about it earlier, so for those of you who don't know, basically it's a consortium of, of, of willing libraries who put together the money which basically replicates the, the BPC. So the funding model from our point of view as a publisher is that it's a BPC equivalent. Um, a problem for it is that authors don't know in advance they're going to get it. It's kind of very much year by year trying to, to um, um, work out how much money is in the pot and then the knowledge on that comes to publishers and says, what do you want to put in it? We then go out to authors and say, we've got this possibility, would you like to do it? So it's not something authors can plan for. Um, scalability and sustainability, which I think have been kind of two words which have probably been in all talks and are vitally important. And those are the kind of the things which I personally think we should try and measure everything uh, around. It's kind of, all these models, are they scalable? I'm thinking about 800 monographs a year. Are they sustainable, thinking about kind of making sure we can publish books in 10, 15 years' time? So I think the Knowledge Unlatched was a really imaginative um, funding model. And you know, possibly it could come uh, close to self-sustaining. Obviously, it's sort of its um, ownership and um, governance has, has changed uh, recently. But, um, but you know, I pay tribute to it. I think it was really imaginative, and we've, we've learned from it. But it is, and I think Martin hinted at, it, at this earlier, it is very admin heavy. There's a lot of coordination in there. There is some concerns about possible free riders. You know, it's a group of willing libraries who are paying free access for the rest of the world. Um, and so you'd have to question the long-term commitment for, for libraries in that consortium to pay. But interesting, and you know, we've had about a dozen books, I think, Matt, is that right in it so far? And, um, Something uh, like that, yeah. yeah. And you know, we've, we've enjoyed working with them. And, uh, and we've seen within those, some of the, uh, some of the print sales have, have held up pretty well. Some have been actually, frankly, pretty low as well. So an experiment we've just started to get involved in, and this is much more of a North American one, uh, Longleaf is a Mellon-funded, very generously funded, Mellon-funded initiative to publish 150 university press monographs, so over three years, with an explicitly digital first workflow. So Longleaf, who have long been a provider of editorial production services to the smaller university press sector in North America, they um, are assuming our responsibility for taking books through to sort of um, um, the early stages, the typesetting, the copy editing, um, um, and to publishing digitally, um, so that the author is guaranteed a digital publication, but the print publication is left to the discretion of the individual publisher. So the funding model is Mellon funded, so it's it's great while the money lasts, but um, you know, there is a, there is a, an end to it, um, and then in addition, there's a seven thousand dollar charge per title to cover the origination costs. Um, so the possible challenges um, around similar to knowledge unlatched as well. I think we have to go to authors after the event to see whether they'd like to have their work put put into it. And obviously it's Mellon funded, so you know what happens when you know the Mellon money runs out. Scalability, sustainability, um, we don't know yet. It's really, really early stages. Um, it might it might work, you know, it might actually kind of become something which we could look at, but it's 
but we really don't know, um, and certainly so in its early stage, it's heavily, heavily dependent on melon. Um, there are some quite complicated challenges around sort of governance and um, um, you know, kind of who's in charge of, of, of what um, in terms of the partnership between Longleaf and publishers. And as I say, it's a finite experiment, both in terms of the amount of money involved, and it's only going to cover 150 monographs. Crowdfunding came up this morning, and um, I can't say very much about this because it's confidential. Ben has been um, uh, pioneering our first ever, I think, first ever CUP crowdfunded academic um, project. Um, and um, we don't know, it's very, very early stages. So far, it's just, just one title. Details will be released when it's possible to do so, but at the moment, it's confidential. So if it works, then, um, you know, hooray, we've got, um, the, the money will be uh, provided for similar to a BPC. But um, again, similarly to the other models, the, the, the funding is coming after the publishing contract. You know, we, we can't offer a contract to an author. You know, publication is only going to be conditional if we're, happy, if we're successful in this crowdfunding um, exercise. So it's unpredictable. Um, but it's interesting, I think. And, you know, kind of Martin raised the question of, you know, to what extent we should be dependent on sort of the market for, you know, for funding these things. But clearly there are a lot of pounds and dollars out there which are wanting to find a home, not just for for-profit investment, but also for, for social investment. So I think it's something um, to look at, but also, you know, this is incredibly admin heavy and um, difficult, to, it's really difficult to see how that could work for a whole program. But I don't think it's something we should dismiss. And then finally, spend a little bit more time on what, I'm not too sure whether this is the right term, freemium, but it's something which um, we've been doing a, quite a bit of at, at the press. So basically, um, two versions here. So one is that um, we as the press, we waive the BPC completely um, and make the PDF completely open in the hope that print sales will be sufficiently strong. And we've got a, a very small sample size. I mean, it's a sample size that you can count on fingers of, of one hand, but, but so far it's been quite interesting. And we've used it for shorter books, which are kind of, in a sense, quite provocative, trying to make a sort of intervention in the space. So some of you may be familiar with the History Manifesto. We used it for um, uh, a book about the, um, the way in which um, digital technologies were taking away our attention time. And they're, they're short books, which you can publish as cheap paperbacks, and they work brilliantly, but um, I have to say. Um, but it's a, we don't think it's something which um, we could apply very kind of widely, and it's not at all clear that, that would work for, for an academic monograph. Um, I've also been very heavily involved over the last two or three years in launching a new publishing format, a hybrid books and journals format, trying to combine the best of books and journals, which we call Cambridge Elements. So these are, this is um, mid-form content, longer than a journal article, shorter than a book, 20 to 30,000 words, which we publish digital first, but also available for a very cheap um, print-on-demand print copy. And with all those, we are making each element, as and when it's published online, we're making it completely free to download for the first two weeks. And we're learning and seeing um, you know, kind of interesting things um, from that. And it's been very clear we have a series on Southeast Asia and Latin American studies. And it's been great to see that actually the kind of the download uh, figures there, you know, we're getting terrific um, downloads in, um, you know, in sort of parts of Southeast Asia and Latin America that we wouldn't normally expect to make book sales. So um, for both of those, um, you know, I think there are things to, things to look at. I mean, the, the real big question mark to me is how sort of, um, applicable they might ever be to the, the world of, um, of, you know, of a research scholarly monograph with all the inel in it, you know, we say this, inelasticities of demand that you know, specialist research inevitably attracts. So finally, to conclude that um, you know, open access, um, gold open access is a, is a small but growing part of our, our list. And it's a list, as I'd really like to emphasize, it's really important, and other publishers in the room will recognize this, but these books don't just happen. They're kind of the, the product of a, a long-term sequence of, of relationships and discussions. You know, people that Helen meets at a conference um, you know, kind of 10 years ago with an idea and over time discussing things. A um, whole set of um, relationships, which I say last decades, and they cross continents. We are, as a university press, um, absolutely committed to trying to make our content as discoverable and as accessible as we can to facilitate scholarly communications. That's, you know, that's what, we, what we think we've got to put on earth to, to, to try and, and help to do. And you know, kind of gold open access is definitely part of that story, but like echoing you know, other things, I think we'd really like to, to suggest that we shouldn't let ourselves be confined to thinking that's the only part of the story. There are other parts 
other things which you could be thinking of to improve accessibility. So we're experimenting, we're learning how behaviours change, but I'd just like to, em to, to finish by saying that I think um, you know, for a long-term future, scalability, sustainability, you know, author independence, their ability to, to, to make their informed choices about where they want to publish and so forth, and the maintenance of quality assurance will all be really uh, vitally important for open, however we define it, to succeed. So I've raced through that. I'm not too sure how close we are to tea time, but I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you, Chris. We've got a couple of minutes for one or two quick questions. Thank you for that. Um, I was wondering if we could just talk a little bit more about Longleaf and some of the challenges there. I mean, as I've understood it from John, it's a two-track publishing model in which instead of trying to identify in advance which titles are going to be the ones that sell, there's a different level of investment in some titles. And for me, this caused a slight challenge in the whole credentialing side of monographic publication in that while um, you know, tenure panels say, well, well, you know, economic concerns are not what we're interested in, we're interested in the intellectual side of it. If titles are deemed to have received any less attention in the pro publishing process, I do worry that you've got a, a difficulty in articulating why that was the case, even if it was actually nothing to do with the intellectual sure. content there. Yeah, well, um, we're obviously at very early stages, but um, I mean, I think. Um, my response, and I guess other participating university presses' response, would be that the the um, the the the, the, um, the publications will bear the you know the imprint of Cambridge University Press or kind of Duke University Press or whoever is involved in it, and that you know that for whatever our reputations are worth, that that um, that that imprint will um, will uh, make it quite clear that the um, the work has sort of has met you know kind of you know, pretty rigorous. Um, uh, quality standards, but I think you know I think your question sort of points to the you know the, the confusion and ambiguity in you know out there, and um, it's something which you know we'll we'll see. So we're really at the very very early stages of it. I think it's just launched. Yeah, that's right. And um, so a, a point that I'd make on that front is that I mean I think so 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 the way that it's working at the moment there's this there's this fund available and it uh, breaks down to sort of seven thousand dollars per title, and the way that they're managing that is very much this idea. It, it kind of supports that view of up to the first digital copy, you know. So, so it's the so 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 it's the process sort of post commissioning um, up to the point where that's available. Then the publisher does what they want to with the print. The book is co-branded and and, 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 and and published by them first, actually in advance of the of the print copy. Um, what I think is what I think you're alluding to, and I think is probably going to fall out differently depending on the publisher. Um, certainly from our perspective, we have a, a memorandum of understanding around that we put books forward at a certain point in the process now where we've chosen to do that we don't have a book in the pilot yet um, but uh, but 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 the way it's working for us is that, that that those books would be nominated post commissioning and post syndication for us in other words as we go through the whole process up to that point we wouldn't even to, to the point at which we've got a, we've signed a contract we wouldn't even know that that book was going to be publishing open access now i don't honestly know um, if that is the same for all publishers, I think that was the workflow as it was outlined. But I think it does point to that question about a certain amount of myth busting around this. You know that that again that they're not going through the same the, the same things. I mean, there's another part of it that I think the production side of that. They're looking at a bunch of different aspects. So they're looking at um, uh, uh, optimizing books digitally. You know, the idea is that traditionally the book has been published in print and digital is a bit of an afterthought. So, for example, they're talking about very bold typographic covers, the kind of thing that would work as a thumbnail, you know, in, a, in an electronic repository much better. Um, and also looking at the, at the, at the timing, as Chris mentioned, you know, Long Longleaf traditionally was, was offering a production service for those publishers that didn't have them. So they're looking at that kind of time to market as well. Because one of the things that I remember being discussed in the early stages of that project was the idea that you'd put a digital copy out first and use the attention metrics bestowed on that to determine whether it was worth investing in the marketing heavily of a print copy, whether that was a cost recovery mechanism. I don't know whether that made it into the final version, but that struck me as a really interesting inversion of how we usually think about whether you should heavily market the print copy. But it does then come with this two-tier service where some get the full marketing treatment and others don't. Yeah, I don't, I don't, know, I don't know is the short answer. That, 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 that's not been our understanding of the way the model's working. I mean, I think it's much more that the 
they're creating the digital or they're handing the print back to the publisher. So I guess the short answer would be it's up to the publisher to decide, to decide how they want to approach it from that stage. I would imagine that you know, when we do enter a, a book into the project, I think it would sort of almost go without saying we've published the print as well. And you know, I think one of the things we're trying to work out is what is the correlation between the, the, you know, the, um, the download metrics and sales. And actually, um, you know, I'm not a statistician either, but from what I can see, there is no correlation, and it, um, it, it varies enormously. Yeah. Can I throw this to someone else? Well, actually, time is pressing, and we're due to right now, and I hate to stand in the way of everyone giving a cup of tea. So, would you please also be thanking Chris Ben for the math?